Okay, I can still see people coming in, um, but we're a minute past four, so um, I'm going to uh, to start the session. So good morning and afternoon and good evening to anyone joining us today. My name is Julia Slater and I'm here on behalf of It's Made For You, Softer Foods. And on behalf of It's Made For You and the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar titled, Why Do We Use Texture Modified Diets? An Overview of the Evidence Base and Implications for Practice. So just at the top of the session, I'd like to cover off some quick housekeeping before we start. So please note that this webinar is being recorded. All participants who join us today are in listen only mode, which means that the panelists won't hear or see you and your microphone and video will remain off. However, if you do have any questions, you can submit them throughout the presentation. In order to do so, you can use the question tab on your menu. The panelists will address these questions at the end of their presentation when we'll have a 15 to 20 minute um, allocation for a Q&A period. So IDSI does not currently um, offer continuing education units, but a certificate of attendance will be emailed to anyone attending this session. So that's it for the housekeeping. Now over to our panelists. So by way of introduction, I'd like to welcome to today's seminar, uh, to webinar, sorry, Sandra Robinson and Caroline Hill. So Sandra is an independent speech and language therapist and director of Speech Therapy Works Limited. She has an extensive experience of dysphagia management in the NHS and private practice and in both acute and community settings. As well as supporting patients, she provides dysphagia consultancy and training to businesses. So welcome, Sandra. And then over to Caroline. So Caroline is a freelance dietitian and runs Caroline Hill Nutrition, providing private dietetic consultations and nutrition consultancy services to the medical nutrition and food industry. She has a specialist interest in dysphagia and works along, uh, alongside a dysphagia chef and SLT delivering IDSI training to care homes. Sandra and Caroline, we're absolutely thrilled to welcome you to today's webinar. If you're ready, would you like to begin? Thank you. That's, I appreciate that, Julia. So that everybody can concentrate on the um, slides, I am also to make sure that uh, I am uh, coming across nice and clearly. I am going to knock my video off, so we'll just be looking at the slides. Firstly, disclosures. I know Julia has introduced us both, but just to say, my name is Sandra Robinson. I'm an independent speech and language therapist, and I am a dysphagia specialist consultant for It's Made For You. And I'm Caroline Hill, freelance dietitian, and I'll be delivering the second half of this presentation. And I'm also doing some consultancy work for what it's made for you. Thank you. Next slide. So our learning objectives in this webinar are for you to understand and hopefully then apply in practice. Bolus properties in normal swallow function. The rationale for adapting bolus properties, that is to say, IDSI, in swallow dysfunction. And then the nutritional challenges in texture modified diets. Next slide. Let's think about chewing and swallowing. The masticatory system is an integrated complex that's primarily made up of bones, muscles, ligaments, and teeth. The movement of these structures is neurologically coordinated for efficient, fun for efficient function and for the maintenance of the component parts over a person's lifetime. Controlled contracture and relaxation of the head and neck musculature are necessary to move the mandible, the soft palate, the lips, and the tongue efficiently for effective function, otherwise known as speech, swallowing, and chewing. A neurologic control system regulates and coordinates the activities of the entire masticatory system. Next slide. Within the brainstem, neurons control rhythmic muscle activities for effective breathing, swallowing, and chewing. These neurons are called the central pattern generator, or CPG. 
The CPG is responsible for the timed and integrated activity among antagonistic muscles that's needed to accomplish these functions. Next slide. For example, during chewing, the suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscles contract at the same time that the elevator muscles relax. This allows the mouth to open and accept food. With the bolus of food in the mouth, the CPG causes contraction of the elevator muscles while relaxing the suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscles, thereby producing closure of the mouth onto the food bolus. This chewing mechanism is repeated until the particles of food are small enough to be efficiently swallowed. Ideally, with all of these component structures in place, chewing can be accomplished without excess stress to any of the component parts, because remember, we want them to last a lifetime. Although chewing is typically a subconscious activity, it can be brought into conscious control at any time. Likewise, breathing and swallowing are generally carried out as subconscious activities, but they can also be brought into voluntary control to be refined. We bring the subconscious to a conscious state in rehab. We may not do this when we're aiding a patient with dysphagia using a compensatory measure such as texture modification. Next slide. So what does this look like? On IDZ level seven, it might look a bit like this. Play video. People who can chew can also probably bite. We often consider the neuroanatomical aspects of chewing and how long it takes. What we speech therapists may also need to consider is not simply the time, but the number of chewing strokes. It can be useful to get used to counting chewing strokes to establish a patient's baseline and see the difference between chewing various textures. Also, consider the effect that saliva is having especially if there is too little, xerostomia, or too much, salaria. Ideally, we need to get the bolus to the right size and consistency to trigger the swallow. And we'll come to this. Next slide. And like this, play video. Here we see them chewing the bolus. And wouldn't it be useful if we could have this view during our clinical bedside assessments? Of course, it's not only the mandibular muscles helping to chew, but the tongue plays a very large part in bolus formation and deformation. And not forgetting that taste plays a large part here too, all of which helps trigger that swallow and send the bolus safely down to the stomach. Next slide. So as we've seen, the oral processing of food involves two functions, mastication and swallowing, both controlled by a specific central pattern generator located in the brainstem. Extensive sensory information from the oral cavity is needed for their respective regulation and adaptation to bolus changes in the mouth. And safe swallowing obviously relies on these sensory inputs. Numerous sensory inputs are produced when the food is introduced into the mouth and they evolve during chewing when the food is progressively transformed into a bolus suitable for swallowing. Using the sensory information on the bolus state at any time in the chewing sequence, the CPGs can decide either to continue mastication for further food transformation or to stop chewing to control the lingual forces and movements to propel the bolus to the pharynx. Among the tactile stimuli that are major sources of information about the bolus state, the reduction of food has long been recognized as critical in producing the stimulus, marking both the end point of mastication and the starting point of swallowing. The particle size distribution in a ready to swallow bolus was first named the swallow threshold. Next slide. Then we come to the role of 
lubrication due to both saliva and fluids from foods, considered as a further source of sensory information from the bolus. The optimum time for swallowing may coincide with a peak in cohesive forces between the food fragments. Although a broad range of bolus is, is acceptable for solid foods, especially with voluntary swallowing, it's clear that the bolus has to meet certain requirements to be swallowed. The food science and food oral processing literature informs us that initial particle size influences mastication, with jaw gape dependent on particle size, that is to say how wide you open your mouth for the food. Following mastication, particle size depends on the food type. Hard foods, such as raw vegetables and nuts, are reduced to particle sizes of two to four millimetres. Soft foods require 14 to 20 masticatory cycles to produce particles of this size. So consider how much meat or bread might take. Likely 20 masticatory cycles or many more. We might argue that the properties of this bolus ready to be swallowed is akin to IDSI level five. Next slide. And so far, we've only had a passing mention of teeth. Do we know how many teeth a person needs for effective chewing and swallowing? And do we as speech therapists make assumptions and not always test our patients for fear of the risk of choking? Teeth are 32 small hard structures set in the upper and lower jaw. They're made of bone-like structures which contain blood vessels and nerves. Hence, teeth are living organs which are designed for chewing food. Edentition is the term used in um, medicine for missing teeth. Its causes and consequences are multiple. Generally, to properly chew, it's recommended to have at least 20 teeth that have occlusion with one another. This includes at least four pairs of molars that can help you chew on difficult food items. And the rest are anterior teeth to help you grip and tear on food. Next slide. When we take our patient's history, it's worth considering the effect of other diseases, conditions, their lifestyle, the medication they're on, as all of these can affect dental hygiene and thus teeth. This can help us understand the extent to which the consequences of missing teeth can be treated or managed. Next slide. Deterioration in the jaw muscle activity is positively related to the number of missing teeth. So you might not be seeing muscle weakness arising from a neurological event or changes in efficiency following head and neck cancer treatment, but that your patient has been experiencing a gradual decline in jaw muscle activity through dentition loss. This will help decide if rehab is indicated or if we've arrived at a compensatory route only. Many people have begun to compensate before we see them. And this is why it's so important for us to know our patient's history and baseline. Also, Bone loss can occur when you lose one or more teeth. New bone cells normally form as you put force on your teeth whilst chewing. When you have missing teeth, no new bone cells form in that area, resulting in the bone loss. The amount of bone loss you're at risk of depends on the number of teeth you have missing and where these teeth are located, such as next to each other. The bigger gaps you have in your mouth due to multiple missing teeth, the greater amount of bone loss you're at risk of having. Keep in mind that losing bone can cause your other teeth to become weaker over time. And again, that increases your risk of additional tooth loss. This is why replacing missing teeth with dentures um, can reduce bone loss in the jaw. This will affect bite force as well as chewing efficiency. While some speech therapy colleagues who specialise in MaxFax, ENT or head and neck may not find any of this surprising or new, it can be forgotten in the neuro and acute med specialisms in some cases. And we must always check the effectiveness of dentures, and of course many of us do. 
And there's perhaps something here about even closer working in practice between speech therapists and dentistry colleagues. And we know many hospitals, especially in the UK, struggle to get dentistry input for their inpatients. Next slide. And to texture modification. Um, think of this as the replacement for what the person with dysphagia cannot do. This is why IDSI is inherently compensatory. And here's a tip. When you look at the IDSI audit tool sheets, they include notes at the bottom and they tell you what abilities the person needs to take that consistency. And it's one way to help your patients understand why you've chosen a particular texture. So for example, in that notes section, you will see on the pure aid, um, a pure aid needs to be able to put in the mouth and swallowed whole, no chewing and no bolus formation skills should be needed. Or in the minced and moist, minimal chewing is required. On soft and bite size, chewing ability is needed, but biting is not required. But then when you upgrade to level seven, easy to chew, biting ability is required, as well as uh, chewing and oral processing abilities. That's just handy to have those notes at the bottom of the audit tool sheets. Next slide. The importance of rheological properties, such as cohesiveness and adhesiveness for a safely swallowable bolus, has long been known in the evidence base. There could be an additional springiness perceived by the person chewing and swallowing as well, though this doesn't form part of the IDSI essential criteria. Why does temperature matter? Because it changes the texture. Even if a lovely, hot, smooth, creamy, level four mashed potato meets the IDSI standard on leaving the kitchen, if it sits at room temperature for 15 minutes, its texture will change. Same for heating up cooled or cooked and then frozen food. And this is why on those IDSI audit tool sheets, you will see tests on serving on 15 minutes and on 30 minutes. Next slide. The cohesiveness and particle sizes could be perfect, but our patient continues to experience residue throughout the oral cavity and or the pharynx. Depending on why, it's, it's worth considering that level four may not always be most effective over level five in this, in this instance. So why do I say this? Well, let's take a look at IDSI videos of the spoon tilt test of these consistencies. So video number one, What do you notice about the residue? If your patient struggles to clear residue, might they actually be better on a level five than four? Next video. And if bolus size plays a part on the swallow threshold, might some patients manage five over four? Look at how much less residue there is left behind on the five. It's my suspicion, and I have no data here, just experience, that we're underusing level five. In part, out of habit, we, we have our go-to IDSI levels. And because perhaps we don't always fully appreciate the biomechanics and sensory input from the bolus. And we're not using IDSI in our practice in as critical thinking a manner um, as our rehab options. But then perhaps this is because we fear going from four to five might mean that our patient might choke. Next slide. People over 65 years of age without dysphagia have seven times higher risk for choking on food than infants. After falls, choking on food presents as the second highest cause of preventable death in aged care and a diagnosis of pneumonitis is positively correlated with increased risks on choking. Next slide. Foods that are consistently associated with choking and reported on autopsy findings include meat and bread 
and thus sandwiches and toast, amongst others. Remember how loss of teeth affects the jaw muscles and bone strength? Sufficient stamina is also needed to prepare the bolus for swallowing, with bite-sized pieces of meat and bread requiring more than 20 chewing strokes per bolus. It's not surprising then that choking risk increases with old age, even if you don't have dysphagia. Next slide. Most deaths caused by choking happen in hospital and care homes are also a risk with, in the UK, 60 deaths in 2017 as a result of choking on food, but that does also include objects. The incidence of fatal choking of people with a learning disability is almost 100 times greater than in the general population. Next slide. There were 605 reports of choking related incidents involving adults with learning disabilities over a three year period in the UK. It's a shocking statistic. 41% were in care homes, 58% in inpatient settings, 1% were out and about. In one study, 42% of the 674 adult service users with a learning disability had one or more choking episodes there was a significantly greater occurrence of choking amongst people with a severe learning disability, Down syndrome, people who had incomplete dentition, or they were taking a greater number of psychotropic drugs. Next slide. So when we look at the rationale for texture modification, we have these standout reasons to prevent choking, to increase bolus manipulation and maximise bolus transport efficiency, although I've not gone into detail about it, also reducing pain or discomfort, um, and to um, ensure adequate nutrition. Next slide. But frankly, we need more data on solids texture modification. Much of the literature is related to fluids and its aspiration. As um, Kichera points out, screening and assessment for liquid swallowing safety is well established. The same can't be said for the evaluation of safety to chew and swallow different food textures, certainly not to the same degree. In a Cochrane review of 2018 on food and fluid modification for people with dementia, they did not retrieve any trials that involved modifying food. When carrying out a bedside assessment, do you consider using the Tomas or the Karadaman, which can help analyse oral motor ability alongside your cognitive assessment that may also affect oral processing? And this, I hope, would give you some idea about the kind of risk that the person might have when it does come to swallowing something with greater texture. Is, is there quite the choking risk that you believe there might be, or could they manage a five over a four? because there's less residue. Next slide. So this is from uh, Tichero. The first bite provides opportunities to observe bite strength to fracture, um, an appropriately sized piece of food um, for, their, for the person's oral cavity. Obviously, you're not going to give something really big to somebody with a small mouth. The early chew down, so that's the first five chewing cycles of the bolus, provides an opportunity to observe early food fracture ability and saliva production, remember, we're going back to the saliva too, um, saliva production stimulated via aroma and the physical act of chewing. So again, the sensory stuff. Note that muscle activity is higher at the beginning than the end of oral processing, meaning that more effort is required to break the food down from its initial state. The middle and later chew down should be observed for the number of chews, chewing time and saliva incorporation. Asking the person to stop at the point where they feel the bolus is ready to swallow, if they can, of course, you'll have assessed their cognitive ability. This affords the clinician an opportunity to see the number and size of particle fragments, bolus formation, the moistness of the bolus, with the glycerin and mucin in the well hydrated oral cavity or stickiness 
of a bolus in the dry oral cavity. Reviewing the oral cavity again after the person has swallowed allows the speech therapist to review the particle mouth coating and the moisture mouth coating. Mouth clearing and secondary swallows are to be expected for food solids. As we know from the literature on digestion and nutrition, chewing plays a significant part in nutrition availability. Here's Caroline to explain more. Thank you, Sandra. Next slide, please. So we can't talk about dysphagia without talking about malnutrition. And the reason for that is that we know from the studies that have been done that up to 50% of people with dysphagia may be at risk of malnutrition. So it's really important that this patient population are screened for their risk of malnutrition so that appropriate measures can be put in place. As a result of this increased risk of malnutrition, there are numerous risk factors that contribute towards this. So this can include comorbidities such as dementia, stroke, head and neck cancer. In isolation without dysphagia increases someone's risk of malnutrition. We also know that poor oral hygiene can be a contributory factor and can lead to conditions such as oral, oral thrush, maybe even poor dentition. Obviously, Sandra talked around the role of dentition um, in the swallow function. Both of these conditions can reduce a person's ability to consume adequate amounts of nutrition. And we also know that textured modified diets and fluid have been shown to have a negative impact on a person's dietary intake. And we'll discuss more about this in the next few slides. Um, and additionally, the environment in which a person is eating can also influence the amount of food that is consumed. We know that eating is a very social activity. So encouraging, encouraging patients in their care setting to eat in communal areas can really help to increase dietary intake while also ensuring support and assistance is available where needed. However, we know that for some people living with dysphagia, there can be some embarrassment um, around their eating habits and behaviours. So they actually may prefer to eat alone rather than in a community communal setting. However, I would encourage where possible to remove any stigma associated with texture modified diets and fluids to help support these individuals. From the studies that have been done um, evaluating nutritional intake in individuals with dysphagia whilst on a texture modified diet, it is well established that energy, protein, calcium and fibre intake is inadequate. And we know that energy and protein deficits will contribute significantly to the risk of malnutrition, whilst inadequate calcium intake can be detrimental to bone health and a poor fibre intake can lead to constipation, which can also be worsened with an overall reduced food intake. Next slide, please. So what are the nutritional challenges in textured modified diets? We know that there can be many reasons. Historically, homemade texture modified diets may have been presented as brown bowls of slop, and this has largely had a very detrimental effect, not only on people's um, appreciation of texture modified diets, but also then on patient compliance. However, due to the increased awareness of preparing food that is not only safe, but presented in a way that looks appetizing and appealing, and also recognizable, as a particular food will all help to increase compliance. But we also know that beyond the food, there are other factors um, such as the mealtime experience, which can influence um, and create challenges for compliance. We know that by addressing some of these challenges, we can help to support people with dysphagia on texture modified diets so they have a more positive experience at meal times. We also know that a lot of um, people living with dysphagia may require some assistance and may be quite dependent on that assistance with their eating and drinking. So as healthcare professionals supporting people living with dysphagia, engaging with other stakeholders is invaluable. For example, engaging with the catering team or the chef to understand what individual adaptations can be made to meals um, to take into account things such as flavour preferences, um, can really help to support compliance. And then we also know that both home, homemade and pre-prepared texture modified diets have a role in supporting compliance um, with texture modified diet recommendations depending on the care setting need. And then some additional factors that can influence compliance might be swallowing fatigue, 
cognitive impairments and taste changes and taste loss. Next slide, please. So we know that mealtime assistance may be required to support a safer swallow, but also for individuals who are unable to eat independently. This could be for individuals who have maybe reduced cognition, poor visibility, muscle weakness, or maybe just even require the need for gentle encouragement. And this is where it is important that the person assisting at mealtimes has an understanding of dysphagia and uses positive language around texture modified diet to encourage compliance and support increased intake. And from a study conducted by Wright et al in 2008, this study showed that there was a significant increase in energy and protein intake from both meals and supplements with targeted assistance. Next slide, please. So what are the nutritional challenges exist in texture modified diet? We, knew, we know that the nutritional content of texture modified diets can vary. Um, there are a lack of studies currently evaluating the effects of texture modified diet on oral intake and nutrient density. There is no data for comparison against of texture, homemade texture modified diets against pre prepared texture modified diets. A recent systematic review by Wu et al in 2020 evaluated four studies, studies that examined the nutrient provision of texture modified diets. However, none of these studies were based on the newer IDSI recommendations. But what this systematic review did show is that puree diets are shown to have a lower nutrient density compared to regular diet. And that the most meals did meet the standards for nutrients, um, but we know that consumers of texture modified diets are actually unlikely to finish meals. Therefore, there still remains a risk of inadequate intake. And then a further study by Miles et al in 2019, which evaluated the menus in 10 residential aged care facilities of around 35,000 residents, found that the texture modified diets, um, their servings were not adequate enough for carbohydrate and protein, and that actually only 50% of residents ate full meals. Beyond the nutritional content of, of texture modified diets that are homemade, there are some benefits to pre prepared texture modified diets from a nutritional perspective, as you can be more confident of the actual nutritional content, because unless set meals are for, set recipes are followed for the preparation of homemade texture modified diets, there can be variation in nutritional content. And as a dietitian, this variation can make nutritional assessment less accurate. Um, and we sometimes find that actually the nutritional content is lower than accepted. And now then, therefore there may be a result in over-reliance on oral nutritional supplements. Next slide, please. So we know that the literature suggests that the prevalence of malnutrition risk in care facilities is 1.7 times higher in residents consuming textured modified diet versus standard diet. Uh, but we do know that the use of textured modified diets in combination with the use of things like high energy, high protein foods can improve weight and body mass index. So it's still really appropriate for us to use the food first principles such as food fortification snacks in between meals and high energy high protein food choices to help improve some, someone's nutritional intake whilst on texture modified diet. <clears throat> this is where it comes back to working with the wider team. Dietitians working with the local catering team can help to ensure adequate nutritional intake from texture modified diets. Next slide please. <coughs> Excuse me. So what guidance exists for the nutritional content of texture modified diets? At the moment in the UK, there is no specific guidance for what the nutritional standards should look like for texture modified diets. However, we do have guidance that was produced by the British Dietetic Association and was recently updated in 2019 that outlines um, what food and the nutritional content of food and drink should be, look like in care settings. And within this guidance, there are, it's grouped into two groups of individuals, those that are nutritionally well and those that are nutritionally vulnerable. So those re residents or patients living with dysphagia would class, be classed as nutritionally vulnerable. And as you can see from this table, based on an, an average meal, the nutrient target for someone who's nutritionally vulnerable would be about 800 calories and 25 grams of protein. So this is really great to have these standards in place, and this is applicable to both homemade and pre-prepared 
texture modified diets. <coughs> Excuse me. Just take a drink. Um, but we do know that even if these nutrient targets are met, there may still be nutrient deficiencies unless a person is consuming full meals. Next slide, please. Apologies, just having a little coffee with it. <clears throat> so what is the role of pre-prepared texture modified diets? So a study by Keller et al in 2012 looked at the use of ready-made to use texture modified diets and it found that 74% of participants achieved their weight goals at the end of six months with an overall trend towards weight gain. So this demonstrates that these pre-prepared texture modified diets can play a real role um, for some, some care settings. Next slide, please. Further studies, um, for example, one by Wu et al in 2020 showed that there was an increase in meal consumption across seven different studies using pre-prepared texture modified diets compared to traditional and homemade texture mod modified diets with a significant effect reported with shaped texture modified diets. So from this, we can conclude that Pre-prepared texture modified diets can help to overcome challenges versus fresh, meat, fresh food, which can sometimes offer inconsistent nutrient levels. Therefore, set recipes can be useful to maintain standards and help to address these inconsistencies. Next slide, please. So what is the current practice to address nutrient deficits? We know that oral nutritional supplements are widely used um, and the latest data suggests that about 54% of hospital patients on texture modified diets are prescribed some form of oral nutritional supplements. However, what there is data lacking is the data on compliance of oral nutritional supplements in, in this popula patient population. We also now in the UK have a number of pre sick and oral nutritional supplements now available, which is great because these can help to overcome barriers such as incorrect consistency and unsafe sickening practices from trying to modify existing oral nutritional supplements that do not maybe meet an insulin level for that individual patient. Next slide, please. So what is the future of texture modified diets and nutrition? So we need more data and studies since the rollout of IDSE. But one question I would ask is, has the raised awareness of dysphagia and recommendations for texture mod diet and fluid improved nutritional in intake? And I would say yes, more than likely. Since the implementation of IDSE in the UK, more conversations have started to take place about dysphagia care and management. And there's been more collaboration between speech and language therapists. And I feel that this has a, had a real positive impact on the diets provided for people living with dysphagia, which will then undoubtedly have a positive impact on their nutritional intake. So what else can be done to improve nutritional intake whilst on texture modified diets? Training, as always, is paramount and not just training with those healthcare professionals who are directly involved with um, the care of people living with dysphagia but the wider care team so anyone who's assisting with um eating and drinking at meal times the catering team all stakeholders that are involved is really important to have them all trained so everyone has a great understanding of dysphagia and the role that diet can play within that from an individual healthcare perspective collaboration between stakeholders is really really important and i know from my own clinical practice that that can make a real difference to patient care and clinical outcome and then also not forgetting the use of pre-prepared texture modified diets these can play a really valuable role in certain care settings and situations where maybe you don't have the access to um homemade texture modified diets or there are challenges around preparing them to achieve a safe consistency. Next slide please. So we hope this presentation has inspired you to consider how you can use this information to overcome the challenges in your clinical setting. We welcome any questions and if you've got any examples of solutions already in place that you are happy to share we would be much appreciated. Um, and whilst we're get ready to get answers in this question, here are our contact details if you'd like to follow us online and have any further queries. Thank you very much and we open the floor to questions.
Thank you to Sandra and Caroline for sharing with us all today. So as um, Caroline just mentioned, we'll move on to the question and answer period. So if you do have any questions, you could submit by clicking on the question tab. Um, and we want to be respectful of people's time. So we'll try and stay focused on relevant questions for today's topic. For general information on the IDSI framework, testing methods and official resources, please visit our website, idsi.org forward slash resources. So I can see that there's been a few questions coming in. So um, I will kick off with the first question. So the first one is, do level four purees have to be thick like pudding and contain thickness? Can purees without this thickness, such as POMS puree, be used? That was the first question. Okay, I will admit, I, I actually don't know what POMS puree is. I'm not sure where you are in the world asking that question. Um, whenever anybody ever asks me about a particular type of food or type of consistency of food and how it relates to a particular IDSI level, my answer is always, does it pass the IDZ audit tool? That's your answer, because you will get lots of questions from your patients and families and, and um, other staff members. Can they have this? Can they have that? And you, you, you could go on forever. There's lots of different types of foods. But my, um, my stock answer is, does it pass the IDZ audit test? And then not only does it pass on um, first creating the food, but remembering that temperature is part of the test. Does it still pass at 15 minutes? Does it still pass at 30 minutes? And, and I've had patients who take up to an hour to finish a meal. So what's happening to that texture after an hour? Um, does it need to have thickener added? Um, this is usually where our, our chef um, comes in. And one of the things he would argue is if you prepare food adequately, you don't necessarily need to add um, thickener as a matter of course. So one of the things that can happen at level four relatively regularly is uh, vegetables, for example. So a number of vegetables are, um, they contain a lot of water. So when you, when you cook them, they can become soft quite quickly. Um, and if you do overcook them, if you cook them too soft and then you're going to blend them, you're going to have a lot of water. And that could result in a level three liquidized rather than a level four puree. And you know the difference by doing your it's yield at all. And the level three um, is also equivalent to one of the fluid tests. It will just about drip through a syringe. So you'll know that that's too thin. If How you get that back to a level four, if adding thickener is a way of doing it, ideally um, it would be best to cook vegetables with a high water content um, just in part, so um, parboil or um, al dente. So it still has some firmness to it because you're going to blend it anyway. And once you've blended that al dente vegetable, cooked vegetable, you're gonna retain the color nicely. You're going to retain nutrition and you're also going to be able to pass the EDZ audit level four more readily. Um, I don't know if Caroline's got anything to add. No, you've answered that really well and I think like you say the nutrient side of things is really important if you once you start overcooking vegetables you're going to get nutrient losses within that water so yeah al dente and like you say blending it down then to make to get it to the right consistency and, and if you do have challenges in the home setting in particular for your community patients and they're finding that really difficult then it is as well to also consider some um, pre-prepared whether that is just things that you can pick up straight off a shelf in a supermarket because of course you're going to have some desserts, for example, that would immediately meet level four without any particular preparation. Um, and I'm also not necessarily recommending that your patients and their families do an ITZY audit test on every single meal they have. But that does just help them to get their head around the idea of what it is. Um, and of course, you do get the pre-prepared meals to your door. Thank you. OK, so on to a question. We've talked about water. So how can we thicken water for patients who are unable to tolerate it? Oh, the water question. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK, I don't actually recommend thickening water for a number of reasons. One of them is it's really unpalatable. 
And we know that significant numbers of people with dysphagia become dehydrated. And sometimes they've become dehydrated because they don't like thickener rather than the, the, because we do know that if you thicken a drink, you don't lose the hydration properties, you retain them, but people drink less because it's not palatable. And I always say, if the drink has to be thickened, give it a flavor or consider free water. You have to be very careful to understand the risk of that with your patient and consider looking at the Fraser free water protocol, making sure that that's something that would serve your patient well, whatever it is they've got going on, whatever setting they are in, is that something that is realistic? But I found that free water um, has helped to keep patients hydrated. It's also had a therapeutic effect because of course, you're helping your patient to get used to doing something that is difficult, but you're also not um, in, in as risky a state as if, as if they were perhaps aspirating thickener. So if you compare, say for example, somebody's on a thickened drink and they're having um, the thickened water, but from time to time that is going down the wrong way and they are very vulnerable to pneumonia, which of course is multifactorial. It isn't just aspiration of thickened fluids that can cause pneumonia. It is also the state of their mouth. And this is why the, the protocol comes in. If you are, um, if you've got a healthy mouth and a healthy airway such that you're not taking infection back down onto the lungs if you do aspirate, then aspirating water in and of itself is not the end of the world. If it's still, if it's not too uncomfortable for your patient, if it's not um, having them um, result in prolonged and distressing um, or painful coughing bouts, then why not just keep practicing with water? Because what you're doing is you're challenging the system. If you don't challenge the system, you're not rehabbing the system. The brain and the body need to learn what to do when there is a problem. So you've got to let the problem happen. Now, our, our, our expertise comes in at, at what level? Where do we understand the risk to be for this person? How much can we push so that we can rehab? Because if we just keep compensating all the time, then this person will stand no chance of overcoming that difficulty. Um, we won't necessarily achieve um, a safer swallow because we aren't challenging the system to overcome those difficulties. It's not learning what to do. I, I'll never forget um, a video froscopy or a modified barium swallow that James Coyle showed on one training um, where the first swallow um, on liquid was gross aspiration it looked terrible and i think the vast majority of a speech therapist was just gone nope stop no more but he kept going and kept going and kept going and each swallow got better and better and better and by i think this is off the top of my head the seventh of the eighth swallow there was no more aspiration the system has to learn so we have to and this of course i'm talking about um, neurology here so we we have to let um, our patient have to take the risks at the right level. Um, of course, there are some for whom that's just not going to be a realistic prospect at all. Um, and we do need to use thickener in drinks, but I would also argue that flavor not only makes it more palatable and reduces the risk of dehydration, it improves sensory feedback. Remember what we were saying about saliva? Um, it helps to produce saliva when you've got aroma and taste. So adding that taste in could also improve the swallow function. Great, thank you. Okay, so on to the next question. Um, some cognitively impaired patients with very long feed time, either eating on their own or need to be fed, seem to be more comfortable to drink than to eat solids. Is there a recommended good approach for them to help them meet their needs? whatever suits that individual patient every time. Sometimes I'd ask, why is that happening? And could it be that it's not an intrinsic problem to the person's condition? Is it an ex extrinsic problem? Is this actually something to do with the manner in which they're supported by others to eat and drink? Is it something to do with time of day, positioning, um, 
is it that they've they were put off once by a bad experience and they've lost confidence um and it's it's about trying to reintroduce things back in the other thing that i'm also really wary of sometimes is de-skilling our patients i go into care homes a lot and there's a significant number of people on level two thick fluids from spouted beakers and level four puree diet now it may be that that's ideal but i I suspect that for a number of people, they could be upgraded. Were they to have the right level of support um, by well-trained staff members who are also confident in helping people? Um, so there is no one size fits all when it comes to what is the best level for this type of patient. Um, or, you know, there's so many different presentations of um, a swallow difficulty as a result of stroke, as a result of brain injury, as a result of neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, all the rest of it. And of course, all of our individual patients have had different forms of eating and drinking, different habits um, before they began to have dysphagia. So we also need to understand how did this person eat and drink and what were their preferences, so needs, wishes, preferences, before they had um, dysphagia. And I think to add, just add, to add on that, for that particular patient group, so those with dementia, taste does change. So it might be that actually the food that is being presented to them, even though it's maybe completely safe consistency wise, it doesn't taste how they would expect it to. So their experience could be completely different. So it might be them looking at alternative flavours that might then boost their attraction, I suppose, and their appetite for food over the fluid side of things. It's a good point and this is where supporting people not only to get the texture right but to get the flavor right do we need to make it sweeter do we need to make it um you know an enhanced flavor that we know they enjoy mm -hmm. um or was it something that previously they really enjoyed but as a result of taste changes they no longer like it and we're having to do lots of experimentation to find out what the preferences are and of course some people can tell you and others it's more difficult so we have to just keep trying lots of different um, flavors and approaches. And it could also be about mouthfeel. So I, it has just occurred to me, perhaps something in that question is about mouthfeel. A number of people no longer like the, the sense of the particles or the, the bits or the lumps in food, and so do prefer um, smooth foods. Um, there probably isn't a great deal. Once, what I think every single patient I've ever met where that's been the case, um and it wasn't the result of an acute episode where they were confused for example and then soon recovered i think that's pretty much stayed the case so we've got to a level four or possibly even a three um and we've had to stay there because to give anything with any particles or bits in it has been um an, an unwelcome um uncomfortable mouth feel to the person and they've just they've been spitting it out. Okay, great. Um, so I think we'll do one final question. Um, so what food equipment should be used if preparing minced and moist or soft and bite-sized foods? A knife. <laughs> um, the, the manner of cooking the food, I mentioned before about cooking vegetables to more kind of um, uh, an al dente but for the for the five and the six cook cook them softer so that you can then chop them more readily um uh, correct me if i'm wrong caroline but i think often when we've done work with a chef he said it's, it's to chop the food after it's been cooked not to cook not to chop it up and then pop it in the pan yeah um so it's chopping skills, especially for your level five at four millimetres for adults, two millimetres in paediatrics. Um, and of course, it can be a little, a little less, but it can't be over that. Um, and you can slightly mix and match. So I know in the past we've had meals made up when we've done our training where it would be a level five base. So the meat would be cooked and then finely chopped to four millimetres and then it's been topped with a creamy um, potato mash um, but you, you it's a knife for level five and again it's a knife for level six to the one and a half centimetres 
cubed, I guess, 3D, um, and a ruler. Um, I know it's been recommended a few times that perhaps um, the chefs and anybody else who's preparing um, food at home do take a ruler to it and check the particle sizes. And if you are doing the IDSI audit tool tests, you're going to, the only way you're going to know if it's truly the right particle size is to take a ruler to it. So, or you can also use the fork, the can't you, as well? The prongs between the fork are the right size for level five as well, aren't they? Um, but yeah, ruler. Yes, if you've got a, reg a regular dining fork, then yes, the prong sizes in between. And again, do look at the um, the IDSI website videos um, for the audit tool tests, and you'll see how um, what the fork can look like to help with um, measuring that. You can see how um, it is against rice grains and things as well. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's also when you're doing the test, pretty much it's just things like spoons and forks. Um, pressing it down, making sure that it doesn't change shape and bounce back up to its original shape, that it does mush down when you when you press it with a knife or a fork, that, that you'll leave lines in it with a fork. Um, so really the equipment, you don't need anything, um, you know, big and expensive or posh. Um, a, a, a knife, regular cutlery, chopping knife, that's pretty much it. And I think a good starting point is just understanding what happens to food when it cooks. So what happens with certain foods in terms of like how much moisture maybe they leach out or how much they require to get them to a softer consistency, because then you're going to have to do less manipulation to it at the end. Exactly. And, and it is about remembering, isn't it, that what we're doing with IDSI is we're doing what the oral cavity can't mm -hmm. or what the pharynx can't manage. Um, or even the whole of the system might find it tricky. So we're, we are compensating. So it's almost like we're pre-chewing or pre-biting um, so that the person doesn't have to do it. Um, but I would highly recommend um, using those videos to help your patients or their families or other members of staff to understand um, what the food should look like, appearance, um, how cohesive the bolus should be, that it shouldn't be too adhesive and to understand the difference that temperature makes. Okay, so that marks the end of the Q&A session. Um, so if we didn't get to your question, keep an eye out on future eBytes where we'll try to address them. And you can sign up for the eBytes from, from our website, idsy.org. So that marks the end of this webinar. But before we go, a reminder that a recording will be available on the website and on the YouTube channel next week. And if you know of anyone who'd benefit from listening to the recording of this session, please share it with them once it's available. So thank you so much to Caroline and Sandra today for your very informative Pleasure. and interactive presentation. And thank you to all the listeners for joining us today. And we've hoped you found this information useful in your practice. And so we'll be signing off now. Have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye.